God with us, encountering Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew. God with us, encountering Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew. We are in Matthew chapter 22 today, in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 22. Let's open in prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, just thank you for this day. I just feel like this day is a reminder of the, the, the change of the season, and it's a reminder to us that you're, you're, that you're steadfast, and that things are always going to be changing, but you, you are always there, that you're, you're our rock, uh, that things around us are going to change, and no matter what season that we're in, a new season's going to come. And for that, I'm thankful. For that, I'm thankful that you're steadfast and that you're always true to us. You're always here for us if we just remember to reach out to you. So thank you. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for continuing to draw us to yourself. Thank you for giving us community. Thank you for giving us other people that we can reach out to while we're here. Teach us how to love you and love others. Teach us how to love you and love others. And I just ask that you send your spirit upon us today to break open the scriptures. So break open our hearts to receive what you would have for us in these scriptures as we, as we study and reflect and just speak to us, Lord. Speak to us. Speak to us. Speak to us. May your spirit stay with us as we go throughout our day and our weekend. And we ask all this in the name of your precious son, Jesus. Amen. Okay. So today we are starting off on um, Matthew chapter 22, verse 15. Matthew chapter 22, verse 15. And it's talking about um, paying taxes to the emperor. Okay, so then the Pharisees, excuse me, went off and plotted how they might entrap him in speech. So he's just talked to him about... Um, He's basically, over the last couple of stories that he's had for them, the last couple of parables, um, by their own, this question and answering, by their own questioning, they have condemned themselves because Jesus is posing these stories um, that are pretty obvious, um, that, that are indicative of like, God had created this for a chosen people, and the chosen people weren't good stewards of it or didn't follow the will of the Father. And so then it's opened up for for all. And those who did not produce these good deeds or their lives were not reflective of being in communion and being a chosen people, they would end up, um, you know, where there will be wailing and grinding of teeth. And, you know, so they know that Jesus is talking about them. They know Jesus is talking about them. And so they're moving on and they're plotting. Um, I think they figured out that he's pretty sharp and they're trying to figure out how they can entrap him. All right. How they can entrap him in his speech. They sent their disciples to him with the Herodians. Okay. The, the Herodians, those were people who followed Herod, King Herod. It was, um, let's see, I wrote it down. Tiberius Caesar. No, wait, that was Caesar. Never mind. With the Herodians saying, teacher, we know that you are a truthful man and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. And you are not concerned with anyone's opinion for you do not regard a person's status. So it's almost like they're building them up. They're saying, we know who you are. You know, we know that you, the last shall be first and the first shall be last. And you eat with sinners and you don't care whether they're poor or prostitutes or, you know, tax collectors. Like you don't care. You're not regard, you don't regard a person's status. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it lawful to pay the census tax to Caesar or not? Um, the Pharisees and the Herodians, though, these would be people like, it's almost like um, the law of man and the law of God, okay? So it's like they're, they're coming together or he's trying to pose two sides against each other. It's like he wants them to take a position. Um, they're, they're trying to say, depending on, if I answer this way, it's going to tick off this group of people. If I answer this way, it's going to tick off this group of people. So they're, they're trying to entrap him. And, and so they ask this question about paying a tax. Is it, what is your opinion? Is it lawful to pay the census tax to Caesar or not? 
knowing their malice. So Jesus knew their heart. He knows the dispositions of our hearts. He knew the, their heart. He knew their malice. He knew that, that they were not asking a genuine question. He knew they were trying to entrap him. He says, why are you testing me, you hypocrites? You know, as if we're just now seeing that they're hypocrites, you know. Um, Show me the coin that pays the census tax. Then they handed him the Roman coin. He said to him, he said to them, whose, in, whose image is this and whose inscription? They replied, Caesar's. At that, he said to them, then repay to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and repay to God what belongs to God. When they heard this, they were amazed and leaving him, they went away. All right, so let's look at his response. Well, first he says, show me the coin. Show me what coin you're talking about. Show me the coin that pays the census tax. And bam, they handed him a Roman coin. All right. So the fact that they handed him a coin, that they had a coin so readily available, and these are the Pharisees, okay? So they were the legal, I mean, they were the, uh, like the spiritual teachers of the day. They are the, the, you know, religious leaders. So they, they so quickly had a Roman coin available. That lets you know that they were, um, that, that they were, they it implies their use of it, okay? And when that implies their use of it, then they, um, there was financial advantages, you know, I think we know from studying and even seeing some of that, that they were in cahoots as much as they, as much as they acted like they hated it. It's like, um, they acted one way, but they under the table went along and did what they had to do to be able to make their lives peaceful, um, with the Romans. Right. And so they were sort of in cahoots and they were accepting of the, um, it's like they knew the advantages that they had for partaking in some of some of this with this Roman administration, right? So the fact that they had that coin so readily available lets you know that they were using it, even though they're trying to plot and, and hem Jesus up with this question, all right? But Jesus just says, you know, um, they said it's Caesar's and then repay to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and to God what belongs to God. Jesus's answer, it, it did a couple things. It avoided taking sides, okay? But it also took the argument to a whole new level. You know, Jesus is saying, if you're using this coinage underhanded or, or just out front blatantly using it, then you pay to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. If you're partaking, then that's what you owe. But you repay to God what belongs to God. And, you know, this takes this to a whole new level. And what it means is that rather than be concerned with um, this type of a question, what you need to be concerned with is, are you repaying God with the deeds that you should be repaying God with? based on um, his love for you. And, you know, it's just like he had called them out before. Is it the fruit, does your life indicate a life, is your fruit indicative of a life lived with that relationship with God? Is it indicative of uh, a life as God's chosen people? So he takes this argument to a whole new level with the Pharisees. And they know what he's talking about. They know what, it's, they know what he's talking about. That's why it shuts them down, you know? Um, they don't have anything to say. They were amazed at his response. Um, and, and I think it almost makes me think that they're realizing that they just can't out, out argue him. They're not going to really be able to get him hemmed up. You know, they're not going to be able to get him hemmed up. He takes that argument to a whole new level, but it's, what's that for us? It's back to the fruit, you know, just like we talked about yesterday, does do, does is our life indicative of a fruit the fruit of our life indicative that we have a relationship with god that we know that we're chosen by god do we live a higher calling you know or are we getting thrown around with the stuff that's going on in the in the world you know i think it's a very um it's a very now message for us really it's a very now message for us okay we can't get too distracted by the things of this world. We can't let the things of this world prompt us to bear rotten fruit or no fruit, okay? We can't stay holed up in our house bearing no fruit and we can't be, the fruit of our lives has to be indicative of the gifts of the spirit, okay? We can't be bearing bad fruit and us think it's for a good cause, all right? Because we're still at the end of our life going to be judged on our fruit. 
judged on our fruit. So our relationship with God has to be indicative. The fruit that we bear has to be indicative of that relationship. The question, uh, uh, questions about the resurrection. On that day, the Sadducees, now we have the Sadducees, approached him saying that there is no resurrection. They put this question to him saying, Teacher, Moses said, If a man dies without children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up descendants for his brother. Now there were seven brothers among us. The first married and died, having no descendants, left his wife to his brother. The same happened with the second and the third through all seven. Finally, the woman died. Now at the resurrection of the seven, whose wife will she be? For they all had been married to her. Jesus said to them in reply, You are misled because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God. You are misled because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God. At the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like the angels in heaven. And concerning the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was said to you by God? I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. When the crowds heard this, they were astonished at his teaching. Okay, well... If you remember, the Sadducees were um, a priestly people of the day who only believed in the first five books, the Pentateuch, okay? That's all they believed in, and, and they followed the letter of the law. They did, not, um, they did not follow any oral tradition like the Pharisees and, you know, um, anything that came after the first five books, they did not follow, okay? So they were very legalistic. They um, followed the letter of the law. They, um, they didn't follow or uh, adhere to any teaching that came after the first five books, which means they did not, um, they did not believe in the resurrection of the dead. And so this is, they're trying to come at Jesus, um, by posing a question about that, which they don't believe anyway. So they're trying, uh, the, the scenario that they use, uh, is almost a ridiculous scenario, um, with, you know, all these, brothers and taking the same wife and all that stuff and you know what jesus is saying is like you're misled because you do not know the scriptures or the power of god um there's ignorance of your knowledge but there's also a lack of faith um you don't understand heaven you don't understand eternal life um at the resurrection they neither marry or are given in marriage but are like the angels in heaven um, there are certain, when we're in this world, in, in this, in this, in this world, we have different type of relationship than what heaven is going to be like. Um, we don't have our bodies. I mean, you know, it's our, it's our soul that lives on forever. And so the relationships that we have here, um, it's not the same type of, like, the, the world here is not eternity. It's not the way that it's going to be in eternity. Um, the sexual relationships of this world will be transcended. The risen body will be the work of the creative power of God. Um, and, and it makes me, so there's no marriages, okay? The, the marriage in heaven is the marriage supper of the Lamb, okay? That's the only marriage that's in heaven. It's like, it's like when you go to heaven we don't need that anymore. Okay. We don't need that anymore. Our relationship, heaven is, is complete and perfect union with God. That's heaven. Um, so the relationships that we have here do, everything's transcended. Everything is elevated. It's taken to a different level. Okay. So, um, the, the, the union that we have is with God. It's not, um, of this world. And, um, you know, and it, and it makes me think about there are different humans are not angels and angels are not humans and humans are create or angels are created beings just like a humans are created beings. Um, but I, there's just something to be clarified here. Humans, whenever they die, we don't ever become angels. We'll always be having been human beings with the spirit. Okay. Uh, and with a soul and um so we don't ever become angels angels are created beings by god and they will always be angels so 
However, when we go to heaven, we will become a part of the great cloud of witnesses and we will become saints. Okay, so there's, there's just a difference there. We become like the angels, so we will be in heaven in the throne room at the banquet table, um, but not with the relationships that we have here on earth, okay? Those relationships are transcended. Um, so, and, and, and it's almost like when Jesus says you don't know the scriptures, um, he, he's talking about like in Exodus, it says, because he talks about um, when he says, let's see. Have you not read what was said to you by God? I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Okay? He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. That quotes Exodus when he says, when, when God says, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. I am not the God of the dead, but of the living. Like, they live on. Although it doesn't necessarily speak specifically about the resurrection, it talks about eternal life there. That, that just because our earthly bodies die... Our, our soul lives on forever, and God will always be the father of the living. We're spending, there. it's eternity, and we're going to spend it somewhere, okay? We're going to spend it somewhere, either with God in perfect union in heaven or eternal separation from God in hell, okay? So, there is everlasting life, okay? So, God is the God of the living, and, and so that's why he's saying, don't you know the scriptures? You're supposed to know the scriptures. So this is what, this is what was said in Exodus. I'm the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. All right. Um, there's also a reference here to, um, in the book of Wisdom, chapter 3, that human immortality is connected with the existence of the body. And... If you go to Wisdom 3 at the, at the beginning, it's a, it's a beautiful, it's about suffering, but it talks about the souls of the righteous are in the hand of God and no torment shall touch them. You know, when our souls live on and, and God takes care of our soul, okay? The souls of the righteous are in the hand of God and no torment shall touch them. They seemed in the view of the foolish to be dead, Okay. And their passing away was thought an affliction, and their going forth from us utter destruction. So it would seem as if we died, but there is life everlasting. Our soul lives on, and it's in the hand of God. But they are in peace. This is still in wisdom. But they are in peace. For if to others indeed they seem punished, yet is their hope full of immortality. Chastised a little, they shall be greatly blessed, because God tried them and found them worthy of himself. As gold in the furnace, he proved them as sacrificial offerings he took them to himself so this is in the this is in wisdom chapter three and it just talks about the soul living on the soul lives on and it's in the hand of god and god cherishes our souls so you know that's what he's saying to them whenever they're they're not believing in uh the resurrection okay and jesus just quotes the old testament scriptures and basically says well for one you're falling short because you only believe the first five books um so you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. The power of God takes everything in this world. And I mean, this world is just temporary. Okay. The power of God is what raises us and, and, and moves us on to everlasting life. Preferably with him. Hopefully with him in perfect union. That's why the relationships of this world are not the same relationships that we will have um, if, when, when, we're, when we go to heaven. And I would, I would challenge you today when we talk about this resurrection, if, if there's anything in this world that holds you to it, if you, and I, and I believe I've said this before, but we have to ponder this, okay? Um, if we need anything in this world, we're not ready for God. If we need anything in this world, we're not ready for God. We may have to lay it down. We may have to lay down family. We may have to lay down our beloved pet. If we, you know, I can't leave this behind. I don't want to die because I don't want to, you know, leave my, my beloved this or my beloved that or my beloved. You can't love anything more than God. If you need anything in this world, you're not ready. You're not ready. So there's more purification that needs to take place, okay? Because we have to be fully present in ourselves 
for, for to just be completely and totally ready for him okay if there's anything in this world that you need you're not ready for god we're not ready for heaven and that's okay because he's a patient father and he just waits for us to you know we have to what lose our life to gain it it's okay he's patient but he wants to con us to continually you know um reflect upon ourselves and reflect upon our relationship with him because he wants perfect union with us for eternity. He created us for that purpose. In his image, in his likeness, to spend eternity with him in heaven. Okay? We're spending eternity somewhere. We're spending eternity somewhere. Okay, you guys. That's good for today. Tomorrow we'll get on to um, verse 34. I hope you guys have an amazing Saturday, and I'll see you in the morning at 7 a.m. God bless you.